Hello all, Rick here with a look into the Sol system as depicted in Star Trek lore. We already know a great deal about Earth, for some reason it features a lot, but what of the other planets, colonies and starbases within the system? It is after all the capital of the United Federation of Planets. I will be looking at its composition primarily around the late 24th century, because there was far less in the early days of Starfleet, and who knows what by the 32nd century. I will also be drawing from beta canon content to add to the unknown. Before we touch on the planets however, what about Sol itself, the Sun? Well, there are several artificial satellites around it, but these are more akin to sensor arrays and solar activity monitors, nothing on the scale of a Dyson ring to harvest solar energy. And that's about it. Moving on now to the closest planet to the Sun in our system, Mercury. Due to its slow rotation, the 4880 km almost sphere has one side exposed to the Sun far more often. This side is completely uninhabited due to the extreme radiation and heat it receives, and while Starfleet no doubt has the technology to create a base here, the question is why bother when there is so much more free real estate to develop. However, there are a series of fully automated antimatter refineries on the planet that presumably generate the anti-deuterium for warp drive. Venus is a little more active, and it has several facilities and factories there that create shuttles and automated drones. In orbit is the Sol 2 shipyard, which serves much of the same function as the shipyards over Earth or Mars. The first ground base established was an environmentally sealed base called the North Pole Base as a pre-Federation facility. The planet was a known location for shuttle training in hazardous atmospheres, although the stifling greenhouse furnace will eventually be a thing of the past. By 2371, terraforming had begun on the surface in earnest, and within a decade the difference was notable, but still uninhabitable with an estimate of around 100 years for full completion. However, there is still an agricultural facility on its surface, and Starfleet does have its Venusian campus for training purposes. In orbit, joining the shipyards, we have Ishtar Station, which manages the terraforming efforts. Next up is Earth, which is the capital of the United Federation of Planets, for now. The headquarters of Starfleet, the primary training facility of Starfleet, and the seat of the United Earth Government. It's no wonder that to most aliens, Earth, Starfleet and the Federation are all the same entity. In orbit we have the Earth Space Dock and the San Francisco Fleet Yards, both of which are large enough to have their own videos, so I did. There are a myriad of other orbital facilities however from the Invictus-type defensive platforms to many Starfleet offices, facilities and other space frame docks. One of these is McKinley Station. There is so much traffic in orbits of Earth that managing it is a full-time job, mostly conducted from the ESD. Among the many artificial satellites, there is one natural moon that the Earthers call Luna. The capital of the moon is New Berlin, which was founded in 2069, and by the 24th century there were 50 million people living in interconnected domed cities, such as Tycho. There is a slight Starfleet presence here, as there is in most Federation territories, which has a training outpost. The Orpheus Mining Complex was also based here, and the headquarters of mining operations. For all purposes, Luna is effectively a self-contained colony world, and Beverly Crusher was born there. Moving on to Mars, the Red Planet is best known for Utopia Planitia, the primary Federation shipyards with factories on the planet's surface and dry docks in orbit overseen by many orbital stations. Utopia Planitia itself began construction as early as 2069, and by 2106, the first colonies were established on the planet's surface. Mars had received visitors before that, however, with small installations and stations on its surface as early as the first manned missions of Ares IV in 2032. The original cities were all pressurised and domed cities, but terraforming operations began straight away. By 2155 the planet had a breathable atmosphere, but it was still subject to unhealthy amounts of radiation over long exposure, and the surface was still devoid of life. 
a great portion of its early settlers were Native American tribes who expressed concern over the United Earth Government. However, in 2105, there was a brief civil war over the rights of the Martian colonies, but it resulted in the fundamental declarations of the Martian colonies. This was a foundational document in the generation of future charters concerning human and federation colonial rights. Alongside Utopia Planitia, which had its own surface colony around, the Daystrom Institute also had a theoretical physics department there. Between 2385 to 99, however, the synth attack rendered much of the planet uninhabitable. Mars is well beyond the status as just an Earth colony world and its own power by the 24th century and a separate Federation member. Moving through to the asteroid belt, as you'd probably expect, many of these have mining facilities on them as the belt is a great source of raw mineral resource. There were, however, colonies among these, with Ceres base being the largest port of operation. In 2179 there was a brief issue with piracy in the belt, but I imagine that with the expanding federation, that was eventually stomped out. On to the big boy himself, Jupiter. The planet has nothing. It's a gas giant, although there may be bases within its atmosphere. Starfleet certainly has the tech to do that. The most well-known station orbiting Jupiter is the Starfleet Research Station, which also has its own video. Most of the action is on Jupiter's moons, as we'll also see with Saturn. 20 million people live on Europa, and Starfleet has a base there that studies aquatic life. There is also a resort there called Club Jove. The oceans of Europa have confirmed life in Star Trek, but in one tale, the oceans are also home to transposed Earth species such as the giant squid. Ganymede is home to only 20,000 miners and their families, most of which work for Rykista Industrial Metals across its 20 mines. It has strong business ties based on the exports of minerals to other worlds, including the Klingons. There is another mining company on Callisto, the Dennis and Young Amalgamated. There are references to bases on Io, but I could not find what they were. In the alternate reality of the Kelvin timeline, Io played host to a Section 31 black site and shipyard. Saturn itself is again uninhabited. Titan, however, is inhabited with lunar-like colonies. By the 24th century, however, there was an artificial atmosphere. However, like Mars, the surface was still inhospitably cold and barren. By the 31st century, however, Titan had tillable soil and was on its way to becoming completely self-sufficient. There was a Starfleet Saturn dry dock in orbit for ship repair, and the space around the ringed planet was used for Starfleet flight training, and Mimus Station was a moonside facility that watched over the potentially dangerous flights. It was little more than an emergency station with a minimal crew of Starfleet medical staff who were otherwise engaged in research. The supply run between Saturn and Jupiter was known as the Jovian run. Uranus had nothing on it that I could find. There is nothing interesting about Uranus, probably because most people don't want to say that they work on Uranus. Seriously, there was very little info I could find on Earth, so moving on. Neptune was inhabited. Not the planet, but its moons were mostly centred on the industrial or research aspects. Nerid had a research facility, while Triton featured a refueling station. Pluto is not a planet, but because humans are somewhat endeared to it, it does feature in Star Trek lore. The small ground station of the planetoid is pretty much just an operational travel relay for people to disembark and schedule new flights, it seems, and it is recorded as having permanent inhabitants of only 12 people, a geology team. Pluto Station is in orbit and served as a shipping and navigational hub for the Outer System, and was the primary listening post connected to the sensor grid at the edge of the Sol system. However, Starfleet Archives does have its annex here, containing much of the non-classified data of the organisation. Pluto was selected because the planetoid would survive the death of the Sun itself, and it had no geological activity to ruin the archives in the far, far future. So who knows, it might be all that survives of the Federation in 10 billion years. Another planetoid, 
Eris contains the Iridian Vault, which is a top-secret Department of Temporal Investigations facility for storing their confiscated objects related to time travel. There are many other planetoids in the outermost edges of the solar system, and some of these have even been terraformed into an M-class environment by 2258. One such planetoid had Starbase 1 in orbit, which at the time was the closest Starbase to Earth. I believe this addition to canon was caused by a mistake behind the scenes, but it's there now. Littered all throughout the solar system are a myriad of other stations, ranging from defence platforms, observation posts, shipping transfer docks and other undisclosed functions. With how large the entire solar system is, let alone the available space in orbit of every planet, there is a lot of room for additional structures to feature. Most of the planets have a networked defence grid of automated turrets, and the entire system is under observation by Starfleet and United Earth. So there is always room to add more, is what I'm saying, and even overlap in functionality. So that about covers the notable outposts of the Sol system in Trek, just one of Starfleet's Federation member systems, and still the human spirit of exploration carries us beyond its confines to see what else lies out there. Thanks for watching this video, I'll see you again next time for another lore, gameplay or other sci-fi related one, and until then I've been Rick. Goodbye.